Good morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Matt. Um, last week, uh, Pastor Rob uh, shared a powerful message about the power of testimony. We're going to be back in Acts uh, this morning. I know you're shocked by that. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 23 today, actually the end of 22 the be- and then into 23. And in chapter, um, in chapter 22, we find Paul standing before a crowd where after he's, he's been arrested in Jerusalem. But before he is taken into the barracks, he's allowed to address the crowd and he gives this uh, really beautiful testimony of his life. And what Jesus has done in him, taking him from a man who once killed Christians to one now who preaches the gospel and makes Christians. It was going well, and the Jewish crowd was listening to him right up until the point where he describes the instruction that he received from the Lord, that in fact, the Lord was sending Paul to the Gentiles And at that point in chapter 22, the crowd had had enough. Uh, They literally shout in verse 22 of chapter 22. (laughs) See how encouraged Paul would be by this. Rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. (laughs) That'll really get you going when the crowd shouts that back to you. Uh, If you could avoid saying that while I'm preaching this morning, I'd appreciate it. Um, the text says in verse 23, as they're shouting and throwing off their cloaks, uh, they, and they begin throwing off their cloaks and they're fleeing dust into the air. This, these actions kind of show their horror and belief that, that Paul is speaking blasphemy. So he's, he's shared this beautiful testimony. People are listening. And then yet he just, he crosses the line. As he starts to describe God's heart for the Gentiles, they realize, no, he is not one of us. The commander uh, orders that he be taken back into the barracks and flogged because they want, to, they want to use this as an interrogation tactic and they want to understand why the crowd is so stirred up. And so likely, as he's, be, he's getting ready to be flogged, this is, this is likely going to be sort of uh, a flogging that is sort of a brutal Roman scourging. Like with a, they had a whip with straps of leather with bone and metal tied to the end. And it would cause certainly great harm to the individual, left people crippled for life sometimes. But just as they're getting ready uh, to do this to Paul, to try to get information out of him, Paul reveals at the end of chapter 22 that he's a Roman citizen. And that, that, that fact comes with some rights. And actually the commander becomes a kind of alarmed because he realizes that he has put a Roman citizen into chains. And that brings us to our passage for today. That takes us right up to the end of chapter 22. And I want to start at, at verse 30 of chapter 22 and then read the first part of 23. So let's, let's see where the story picks up. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. And then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. And this, the high priest, at this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Uh, he's good at winning over friends, isn't he? You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it was written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from the Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. 
The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him back into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Um, Paul has an interesting way of getting in interesting situations, doesn't he? (laughs) So here's what's happening. The commander still needs to get to the bottom of what's happening with Paul and what's going on and why is he, um, you know, why is he stirring up all this commotion? What is it that the people are so upset with? The Romans um, are are charged, you know, the commander's charged with keeping the peace of this region. And so uh, he can't interrogate Paul as a Roman citizen with beating him first. That's what he realizes when Paul talks to him about being a citizen. And he, and he doesn't have the right, really, to interfere with the religious activities of the Sanhedrin, but having the authority to keep the peace, he does have the right to call them to convene. And so that's what he's done here because he means to have them help him figure out what is going on and why everyone is so up in arms. Because this is a religious issue between Paul and the Jews, and the Romans, most of all, just want to keep the peace. It's interesting that as then the Sanhedrin begins to interrogate him, that their own sin and dysfunction among these religious leaders begins to be revealed. First, uh, Paul is, is struck without cause by order of the high priest Uh, when that would not have been appropriate by religious law. And then second, something interesting happens. And it, now it seems like Paul's a little cunning here, a little bit shrewd to lead them right into this. Paul talks about, loudly talks about the resurrection of the dead. He says, I'm a Pharisee and I stand here because of the resurrection of the dead. Well, he's obviously, he's talking about Jesus, but what is he doing? He's leading them kind of into a little trap, isn't he? (laughs) Knowing that this is a central issue of division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so the whole assembly is thrown into an uproar and they begin to fight with each other. Now, Let me just make, I want to make just a little side comment. This isn't really the the heart of what I want to say today, but I do want to comment on this because I just found that that little bit interesting. This is what humans do who do not have the peace of Christ. The only reason they are united at first is because they have created a common enemy in Paul. That's the only only, uh, key to their unity in this moment. As soon as the attention is redirected, what do we see? We see that their dysfunction is not just with Paul, that actually their anger and their bitterness, it actually goes down much deeper than that. That it's actually at the root in their hearts. And so here's kind of, here's my little side note on this passage that I want you to catch this morning. Friends, as believers, Watch out for those who do not know any true peace, but only seem to find peace by focusing on an enemy. Do you understand what I'm saying? No one who needs a common enemy to be at peace knows the true Prince of Peace. And if you need me to be any more plain, I'm thinking specifically of the idolatry of politics in America right now. In any case, um, the Sanhedrin gets so crazy that the soldiers have to take Paul back to the barracks, afraid that he's going to literally just get torn into pieces by the crowd. I imagine kind of 
Paul in the middle, the Pharisees over here, Sanhedrin over here, just like pulling him in both directions. And in the midst of all this chaos, uh, Paul is kind of ushered out. But then in the midst of this, in the midst of all the craziness, guess what happens? The Lord shows up again. He shows up in a vision to Paul once again, which he has done with Paul a couple of other times. The following night, it says, I love this, the way that it says this, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul. And what does he say? He says, take courage. You know, um, when I read that this week, you know, the image that, that came to mind, when it says the Lord stood near, and then he says, take courage, it immediately made me think of another story in the scripture that is one of my favorites. I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 14. Do you remember when Jesus comes, comes near and he stands near the boat and he says, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. The disciples are in the midst of a storm. Things are just like chaos around them. And what happens? Jesus, the Christ, comes and he stands near. In the midst of the storm, it says, take courage. You don't have to be afraid because I'm standing right here with you. And then he says, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. At this moment, right, uh, Paul was on the verge of getting beaten maybe to, to within the edge of his life. He avoids that just barely. He's in chains. He's released for just a, a moment so that he can go stand before, you know, the religious crowd and get about torn to pieces by them. Like life is chaos for Paul at this point. And yet in, in the midst of this bleak outlook, here the Lord comes and he stands near and with confidence, the Lord says to him, I'm not done with you yet, Paul. And I think this, this little beautiful moment of God revealing his intention through this vision, it just reveals God's nearness in Paul's life. And it reveals that God is, in fact, actually working out his plan all along, even when it doesn't look like it. What can, we, um, what can we learn from this interesting episode with Paul? I mean, no shortage of action in Paul's life, but what, what can we take from this? I want to give you three things this morning that I think um, could, could apply to your life, apply to our lives uh, in this account from the Apostle Paul. The first one is this. Those who act in obedience to Christ will not always be understood and many times will be ridiculed by those who are not aware of what God's spirit is doing. That's just true. Friends, we are increasingly living in an age where to be a real Christian will mean being misunderstood by society. That's just true. These Jews thought that they knew what was right, but they did not have eyes to see what God was actually doing. And they were so sure of themselves that they're ready to kill Paul for being out of step with what they knew to be true. Sometimes this is, this is what happens when you follow Jesus. People who do not know or understand the gospel will misunderstand you. And sometimes they even hate you. Jesus actually told us that would happen. For believing something out of step with the rest of society. Do you know what, what, we, what we claim as Christians is actually foolishness to the world? That all of life, that everything, all of existence hinges upon the life of one man who walked upon the earth 2,000 years ago, who was, in fact, God in flesh. Killed by the hands of the very people that he created, 
raising to new life again three days later, that all of our life hinges upon that? Do not be surprised when others misunderstand you as a Christian. The very heart of our faith is foolishness to the world. And yet to those who believe it is salvation. This is what happens when you follow, when you follow Jesus. People who do not know the gospel, they, they misunderstand you. And here's what I want to tell you, it's okay. You don't have to be angry about it. And you don't even have to be surprised about it. I think actually in this story, and we see it in the chapter before as well, Paul is at peace here. Last week, you know, as, as Rob was preaching, in the face of a mob, the mob that's like coming after him, he actually, he asks, uh, you know, his jailers, his, the commander, hey, before I go in the barracks, could you just give me a minute? I want to address these people. Who does that? He should be wanting to get away from that crowd. They want to kill him. Like, get me in the building. Get me away from these people, right? No, Paul is at peace. In today's passage, he's faced with, uh, with religious leaders, you know, who have just fury when he simply points out again his, his, his basis in, uh, of hope in the resurrection. There will be a time if you follow Jesus where you have to decide if you are okay with being misunderstood and even disliked for your beliefs. No one who follows Jesus fully will be received well by the world all the time. And if you are always received well by the world, it may be worth asking why that is. Now, the second thing I want you to catch uh, from Paul's experience today is this. The first one is that um, as a Christian, you, you will be under, misunderstood for your beliefs and um, for being out of step with society. Number two is just because something is hard doesn't mean that God is not in it. This is a message, look, you've heard me say this, I'm gonna say it again, I've got one last shot, I'm gonna keep saying it. In fact, um, sometimes when something is hard, it's actually confirmation that God is with you in it. Sometimes we think as Christians, hardship means that we're doing something wrong. And sometimes it does. There are different reasons why hard things happen in our lives. Sometimes we experience hardship that is a consequence from bad decisions that we made. That's not what I'm talking about here. But sometimes hardship is in fact because we're being obedient to Christ in the midst of a broken world. And obedience is not always easy. Paul is in the midst of a very difficult situation here. Would you agree with that? Not the most pleasant of circumstances, not the most comfortable of times in his life. But it's not because God is punishing him or because he did something wrong, it's precisely because he did something right. He's squarely in the center of God's will for his life right here, and yet it's hard. We see that confirmed in this vision in chapter 23 where Jesus confirms that actually not only have I been with you to this point, guess what, I'm going to keep leading you into hard things. What you've done here, now I'm going to use you for in Rome. So I just want to encourage you this morning as we look at Paul's life to and remind you that the Christian life is not about comfort at all costs. If you're looking for comfort at all costs, look for a different faith. <laughs> this ain't it. In fact, right now, if we're honest with ourselves, we live in one of the most cushy, comfortable times and places in the history of the world. When you compare our current existence to other eras or other places in the world, we have got it easy so much of the time.
But when Jesus invites his disciples by saying things like, pick up your cross. If you want to come after me, first deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. He's not inviting you just to sheer comfort. And so often we miss out on God's best for our lives because we're more interested in what makes us comfortable. I, you know, I can't share that, you know, my faith with that person. I'm just, I'm just not comfortable with that. I can't, I can't go on that mission trip. I mean, I'm just, I'm just not comfortable with that. I can't, I can't serve in that way. That's, that's way outside my comfort zone. <laughs> Look, it's my last day, so I'll say what I want. Uh, Jesus doesn't give a rip about your comfort zone. In fact, he wants to drop a faith bomb right in the middle of your comfort zone. He'd just love to blow that sucker right up. <laughs> he, he wants to, listen to me, this is, this is what I'm saying. He wants to walk up to the boat of your life. Remember what I said in Matthew 14, that, that picture of, of Peter and the disciples in the boat? He wants to walk up to the boat of your life while you're clinging to the floorboards, just trying to ride out the storm. And he say, just like he did to Peter, come on, get out of there. Come out here with me. I know it looks hard, but this is where life is at. I've got more for you than just trying to ride it out as comfortable and safe as possible. The utterly safe life is not the Christian life. We have too many Christians at least in name, who want just enough Jesus to make us feel a little bit better, but not too much Jesus that he might actually ask us to do hard things. Well, here's the truth. Jesus is not safe. You either get the real Jesus or no Jesus at all. But you do get to choose. Do you know why it's okay to choose something that's hard? To choose Jesus to, even when you know that it involves risk? Do you know why it's okay to climb out of the boat even when he asks and it doesn't look like it makes any sense? Because in fact, he is the only one in the entire universe who is trustworthy. Amen. Because he's the only one who loves you actually more than you love yourself. So you can trust him. What sounds scary to you is actually an invitation to experience his very best for you. Because he knows you better than you know yourself. I think that's actually what we see in Paul's life. Jesus' invitation to him is very costly. And yet here we are thousands of years later, still talking about his life. Sitting here, really, as Gentiles because of his witness. Just because something is hard doesn't mean that God's not in it. In fact, sometimes that's confirmation that he actually is. Third thing, last thing I, I want to, to leave with you as we reflect on this passage this morning is this. You don't know how God is gonna work out his plan. You don't. You can't always know that. So your only job is to be faithful and obedient and trust that God always knows what he's doing. Do you believe that? We know that in, in Romans uh, 1, and then uh, especially if you flip over to Romans chapter 15, that letter from Paul, that Paul, Paul was longing to get to Rome to preach the gospel, right? This was actually a great desire of his heart. He wanted to get to Rome. And yet, look at how this plays out. It's the persecution from Jews in Jerusalem, 
when he, he kind of says he's been prevented from getting to Rome, he, you know, the plans don't seem to be working out. He doesn't get to, to live into the desire of his heart. And yet, it's this hard thing. It's the persecution from Jews in Jerusalem that by God's sovereign hand actually gets him exactly where he wanted to go. If you read the rest of chapter 23, I'm not going to read it for us this morning. You actually see another example of this, of God just working out his plan in ways that you could not understand. Some Jews get together just after the part I read, and they are so mad. They're so upset at Paul. Uh, Some 40 men make a vow that they will not eat or drink until they have killed Paul. That's how serious they are. They make a vow together that we will finish this thing. We will kill him off. And so they concoct this plan to have him summoned back to the Sanhedrin, and they're going to ambush him on the way. But that doesn't happen. Why? Because of this character that we really don't know anything else about, Paul's nephew of all people. He hears about this plot. He alerts Paul and the Romans, and it saves Paul's life. And so Paul is then, uh, rather than back to the Sanhedrin where he would have got killed on the way, no, he's transferred to Caesarea and Governor Felix, and then eventually he's on his way to Rome. This is just a, just a small kind of a bit in here, but isn't this interesting? The plot of 40 men who are so serious that they vowed that they will not even eat or drink until Paul is dead. That's how serious they are, 40 grown men going to kill his life, all of that is squashed by one nephew who was in the right place at the right time. Do you think that God cannot do what he wants? Bring about circumstances that you don't know about or could never plan in order to accomplish his will? He can because he's God. And so I want to encourage you, your job Friends, as a Christian, is not to try to figure it all out. Your job is just to be faithful and obedient and trust him. You know, I guess um, as I wrap up my time as one of the pastors here at Stillwater today, which this is kind of an odd feeling today for me. This is uh, my last day on staff here, but this is what I really want to leave with you. To just trust the Lord. You know, I came here um, more than five years ago to worship with my family, and then uh, I don't know, two and a half years ago or something, I stepped in as the lead pastor during a time of so much transition, and and now in an attempt to follow God's leading in my life, I step back out to simply uh, just come and sit with you and worship alongside you in the days to come as a church member, but. And we've seen God do uh, kinds of crazy stuff. We've been through a lot of things the last couple of years with COVID and denominational craziness and staff change and culture change and all of it. But my, my one refrain has tried to be, and, and I guess I want to keep saying to you one last time, we can't manufacture anything on our own. We don't get to tell God what his plan is. Our only job as Christians is to make ourselves available and then to be obedient to whatever he asks. That's really it. That's what this life is. And so as I wrap up my time in this role, I just, I just want to leave that encouragement with you. If you've taken new steps with him, don't go back. Stay the course. I really believe that God has so much in store for this church family. But I don't think it's supposed to look the same as just a, any typical church that just spends all their time being busy and offering nice, nice church programs to the community. He has something more radical for you than that, more world-changing than that. And so I just, 
I just want to encourage you, don't, don't settle for the kind of church that's more concerned with getting people in the seats than actually making disciples. Crowds come and go. If COVID taught us anything in the church, it taught us that. Jesus is after people who will go with him to the end. People like Paul who, who won't disappear when things get hard or pushback gets more intense. So don't, don't settle for a church that is simply busy so often busy with stuff that just kind of makes ourselves feel good, like we're doing good things. Look, we have a nice church. No, go for, go for more than that. Press into prayer because it actually changes things. Pursue more of his spirit. Seek God for things that you can't manufacture yourself. Learn to share your faith and become a missionary, right? Where God has planted you. That's a high calling. Like where we're at right now in our world, our world doesn't need, doesn't need any more comfortable, kind of happy, clappy, come here and we'll just make you feel good all the time kind of churches. It doesn't. The only thing that will last in the age where we find ourselves is a church made up of a real family of disciples who prioritize the presence of God above all else and then, like Paul, are willing to offer their lives as a testimony to the world, no matter the cost, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, no matter if they get misunderstood or mocked, because they know that Jesus is always worth it. This, this church in Acts that we've been reading now for over a year, they, they weren't perfect. They had their issues, but they were that kind of church. They weren't half in believers. They were lay their lives on the line, spirit-filled followers. And that's what we need again. That's what we need in this country. That's what Stillwater can be. That's what Stillwater is becoming and will be with the leadership of Pastor Rob and Pastor Jordan. So friends, don't, don't go back. Stay the course. Jesus has something really beautiful for you individually and for this church in the days to come. Lord, may it be so. May we keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You, the one who for the joy set before you endured the cross, scorning its shame, and ultimately sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. May we walk in your steps, Jesus, enduring whatever we may face in the days ahead for the joy that's set before us. Would you teach us, like Paul and like so many others, to be real Christians? to be all in with you and to lay down our very lives as a testimony to the world. We know we can't possibly do that on our own. And so we ask now for the power of your Holy Spirit to be upon this church towards that mission. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.